Why, hello there, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Holiday Show for the Thoughtful Bro. We're so happy to have you here joining us today um, with my very special Elvin guest, best-selling the author. Thoughtful Ho. It's the Thoughtful Ho time. You know you miss doing this with me. See, I was trying to establish a tone. All right, then... go ahead. Go ahead. I'll be okay. Good. All right, starting over. Okay, go ahead. Welcome. Every this is a very civilized thing, Jenna. Um, welcome, everybody, to the Thoughtful Bro Holiday Show. Um, yo, here we go. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, we are here on Thoughtful Bro live streaming every Tuesday at 2. Um, we're here, as always, to talk about what makes great books tick and what makes great authors tick. And today, Jenna and I are going to be telling you about the best books, our favorite books of 2021 and the books that you should be giving to that very special person in your life. Um, a few words from me before I get started and before Jenna just totally takes over this interview, um, as is her want. Um, look, guys, Mighty Blaze, we started during COVID to help match up writers and readers, writers who couldn't go on book tour because of COVID. We wanted everybody to be able to connect as they would have in a non-COVID world. Obviously, COVID is still going on, so we are still here, and we're here for the long haul, baby. Um, we are not asking for any money at A Mighty Blaze. If you want to support us or just show a little bit of the love, just smash that like button, as the kids say. Um, follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, and that just tells us that you guys are following, and it's great for these authors, too, because all authors really want to do is reach people and build communities of readership and you can help that by being part of a mighty blaze so um if you want to get more info about the blaze just sign up for our newsletter at our website on mightyblaze.com you can also listen to our podcast which is now in its third season we are here every week with five six seven different shows talking to awesome authors about newly released books all this hot stuff comes here all the best best-selling national book award winning booker prize winning authors that you could want all on a mighty blaze um, every single week. Um, what else do I have? If you want to ask a question today for me or Jenna, we actually wanted to propose that if you are having trouble finding a book for that special someone in your life, you should ask us. And Jenna is going to play the part of book gift whisperer and tell you what book, uh, book gift to give. Um, so please give us your questions. Ask us about any of the books we're talking about. We're probably going to talk about a dozen or so books that we love this year. Um, but if you have some book questions, some book ideas, and you want to run them by us, um, let us know. Um, that's all I have for the introductory remarks. I want to quickly introduce my fab, fab um, co-host for the, today. Jenna Blum is the New York Times bestselling and number one internationally bestselling author of the novels Those Who Save Us, The Storm Chasers, and The Lost Family. None other than Oprah.com listed her as one of their top 30 women writers um, at work today. Jenna also happens to be the co-founder of A Mighty Blaze. And of course, in October, Jenna published Woodrow on the Bench, uh, her memoir about her senior black lab and what she learned from their last seven months together. The tagline of the book, which already makes you start crying even before you start reading, is for anyone who's ever loved an old dog. Jenna, thank you for joining me on the show today. Thank you for having me on the show, bro, ho, ho. <laughs> you missed me being on your show to talk about books. I was so well behaved during that preamble. I was so well behaved. You know, I was sitting here like, let me in there. Let me in there. I want to talk about books. I knew I had about two minutes before the show went off the rails. And I so was getting a little bit bouncy. So <laughs> that's great. I am ready to bounce. I'm ready to bounce some books around. Bring it on, bro. So we're going to talk about the books that we love. What is the face? Why would Dude, hey, I'm just watching the show here. I'm I'm just a fan like everybody else, Jenna. All right. All right. <laughs> I can order right. I mean, also I would like to point out my holiday outfit and Mark's holiday outfit. And even though Mark has like a wreath growing out of his head, like <laughs> hi Daniel, I don't think that he's quite decked out enough. And next year I would like Mark to be wearing a wreath with candles in it. Like, my man Daniel Ford. Daniel Ford of Writer's Bone. Folks, Writer's Bone is one of the best podcasts out there. Daniel yes, Ford yes, is, is one of the most badass dudes out there in literature, the kind of literary, you know, podcast sphere. Um, get to know Daniel Ford and Writer's Bone if you haven't already, folks. Also, I hear he has a hot tub. I am waiting for my invitation. It, 
It's just a thing that you know about people when you're in the industry. You know who you didn't tell me about his hot tub. You also have a hot tub. (laughs) My goal for 2022 is to get into as many hot tubs as possible with glitter. It's going to be amazing. So, those of you who have hot tubs, invite me. I will come. I'll do a reading in your hot tub. Just putting that out there right now. Hey, I also want to say hi to Erica Forensic, who I just saw pop into the chat. Erica, also a best selling author, an amazing author who has um, another book coming out next year. Um, she's going to be on the blaze. I think her book comes out in maybe March or so it's called girl in ice. So that's going to be amazing when that book comes out, she's going to be on with Hank Philippi Ryan, I think on Mighty blaze. So good. So good. I'm so excited about that. I knew we were going to get you Erica. I mean that in a nice way. Girl <laughs> nice. Speaking of girl nice, I have coffee, but no, it's bourbon time because it's five o'clock in England. And so we're going to just sort of like dish and, um, Erica, if you would want to put um, in the chat your link for your new book, that would be amazing. Bombs, we need that. So um, let's toast to the books of 2021. Cheers. Cheers. We, so we figure out StreamYard song. Yeah, it's always backwards. So cheers. cheers. <laughs> and look, we have to get started. Um, All right. Okay, okay. Okay, we'll do it. And also 2022, I have some recs for that as well, even though I didn't tell Mark I was going to do that. Just stop. <laughs> Just stop. Okay. Just Tell an me. immediate hijacking and just an immediate hijacking. This is why I only have you on once per year, by the way. Um, all right. So, folks, we're going to go through it. Um, what's going to happen is um, I'm going to do a book. Jenna's going to do a book. We're going to talk a little bit about why we think that book is so awesome. And again, me and Jenna just read a ton. We just read, 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 read all the time. And so I'm not saying this, this is the definitive list of the best books of the year, but I also am saying that. I definitely am saying that. So this is definitely the books that you have to read and buy for your friends. So number one for me is a book called A Swim in the Pond in the Rain by George Saunders. Now this is in no particular order. This is like, I'm not ranking these books, but this is just the first one I'm going to talk about. Boom, right there. There we go. That's the cover. Um, This book is terrific. Um, It is a book about George Saunders, by the way, for those who don't know, Booker Prize winner, one of the most esteemed kind of like, he's sort of like a literary saint um, in, in America. I mean, he's Time Magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world, not one of the 100 most influential writers, one of the 100 most influential people in the whole world. world. Um, and he came on the Little Thoughtful Bro Show, and it was one of the great days ever. Um This book, it examines six Russian short stories. It sort of unpacks them, stories by Chekhov and Gogol and um, and, and, and others. Um, And uh, it's based on a class that he teaches at Syracuse about how to write the short story. And I think the best thing, the best way for me to just summarize this book is to just give a few quotes from the book that I just love so much. And even rereading some of these quotes, it's just always inspiring. So here's one for you. Every line in a short story contains the DNA for the entire story. He's big on building a voice out of like a single sentence that works. And then you write another sentence that works and build like that. Um, Another quote that I love, the ultimate goal is to have your book do things that you did not consciously plan. Um, So there's a lot of kind of like dredging in the unconscious for the kind of what should be in a story and what should not. Um, He says, a writer has to write in whatever way produces the necessary energy. We have little choice of what kind of writer we will turn out to be. Ultimately, finding about finding one's voice is about figuring out which of the many voices within you is the most energetic. Again, just another another kind of solid piece of writing advice. And then the last thing I'll say about this book is our interview, which I think um, our producer, Margaret Pennard, who's so awesome, is going to post in the chat. Um, I interviewed Saunders last April, and we talked on the show at the, toward the end of the show about the two things that George Saunders thinks a writer needs to succeed, and they are a willingness to revise, and an attention to causality in the story. Mm-hmm. Jenna Blum, I want to ask you, do you, do you agree with those two things? Th- those, those make a writer successful, or what would you say? A, a willingness to revise, absolutely, because the story like almost never comes out perfectly the first time. I think I had that happen like one time, and I was like yeah. eight, like yeah. eight years old. And causality is incredibly important. I think for me, a short story is about a pivot point in a character's life. The character might not know it, but you're getting a little window into a character's life at a time when he or she is making a decision about Mm -hmm. something that will affect his or her whole life going forward. But I'm thinking about the, I probably shouldn't even be 
having this candy cane while talking about George Saunders because I revere him that much. Also, I have a great George Saunders elevator story. And also, I would like you to tell us what George Saunders said about you. But I, I'm thinking about the DNA of the short story being in every line of the short story. I'm like, no pressure, though. You know, so those of us who <laughs> or novels. But I think that's true. And what that means to me is that there's no line that can be superfluous. There's no line that's throwaway in any way. And it all has to build toward the ultimate conclusion you yeah. want the reader to come away with by osmosis. So yeah. that is my... Okay, so can you tell us what George said to you after? And the only reason I missed that interview, I was going to produce it, was that I was getting my second COVID shot. And I was so mad. Like, I was literally driving to the Polish American Club in Western Massachusetts to get my shot, watching George, like, in my car with Mark. And it was so incredible. But would you like to tell us what he said to you? Well, I don't get literary compliments and tell, but George Saunders had a great experience on the show. I would say that. And he is a very gracious man. And I'm sure he compliments everybody after they give them an interview, but he was okay, very so nice. I'm going to tell you guys what he said to Mark after the show, which I'm going to put on a t-shirt for Mark. Mark can't say it because it would make him look like a D-bag. But George Saunders said to Mark that Mark has an amazing brain. <laughs> I was like, your life is so made. You should get that as a tramp stamp. George Saunders said you had an amazing brain. George Saunders said it. You all heard it. That's like the blurb of a lifetime. And we all know this is true. Like Mark is the thoughtful bro. So boom. You're welcome. You're welcome. Moving on. Jenna, <laughs> what's your what's your first book that you recommend? Thank you for your ask, Mark. I have somewhere. Godspeed by Nicholas Butler. He was on my show. He was and on my show. He indeed was on your show. And I was so excited about this. And I also met Nicholas in the Midwest, in Stillwater, Minnesota, when I was on tour recently for Woodrow on the Bench. And I have to say, I accosted him in this frightening way. Because you know how it is when you read a writer's books and you love the book, um, and then you get to meet that writer in person. It is a BFT. Like, it felt like a really, oops, it goes this way, this way, this way. This is a really, really good book, y'all. It's a really, really good book. I loved Nicholas's first book, Little Faith, which is about people in part of the world I know very well, which is Western Wisconsin, Eastern Minnesota. It's like where my people are from. And he just did this Steinbeckian job of describing this part of the world. Godspeed is about these three guys were contracted to build an impossible house by a very wealthy and mysterious woman who's working on behalf of some other mysterious people. And if the guys can finish the house, they will be rich beyond their dreams and their lives will come true. And if they can't finish the house, then they have to go back to their humdrum lives. And this is all being done. And I, I want to say Idaho, but I might be wrong about that. Um, but it becomes sort of a Faustian bargain about whether they can finish the house and they turn to drugs to get it done and all sorts of bad stuff happens. And it's basically about like examining the role of money and of hope and dreams in people's lives. And I have to say, nobody nails the ending of a book like Nicholas Butler. Like the two books of his I read, I know he has more books, but like both of them, I was like, that was a freaking quadruple Axel, how do you even do that? So when I met him, I was like, listen here, mister. That was a quadruple <laughs> Axel. And how do you even do that? And he was like, I have to go now. So if you want to see Mark's whole interview with Nicholas Butler, of course, it is in our Blaze library on YouTube where all of our stuff lives ever and ever and ever. Mark, yeah. what's your next book? I love that book too. And it, to me, I think we got into, in the interview we talked about, I compared it to um, Reservoir Dogs because I thought it was like, even though it's about the building of the house, it's sort of like a heist story in the sense that like they have to build this house to get the cash and then they have to like do a lot of shady stuff in order to build the house and then people end up getting injured and killed and uh it's just very exciting kind of in a way you might not expect if you heard this is a book about building a house so mm -hmm. um terrific terrific book so my next book is by a friend of mine named caroline kepnes yes oh my god me. Yes. yes so um Caroline Kepnes wrote um, this, the, her first book in this series is called You, and that was the third, this is the third book of that series. That became a show that was on Lifetime, and then it had some modest success on Lifetime, and then that show, show it moved was over. It was on Lifetime? I didn't know that. Yeah, it was on Lifetime was originally. All day, every day, which explains a lot. I yeah, feel. and then it went from you, I mean, see, from Lifetime to Netflix, and then it just completely took off. I mean, I think that's one of the best, mm -hmm. most viewed shows on in Netflix history. Uh, I think it's been viewed like forty five million times. Um, it's such a great book. It's a fun book. It's just sort of like 
oh, it's just catnip for literary people. I mean, the way that Caroline describes it, she says, there's this, <laughs> this was her description on the interview. There's this guy and he reads a lot and then he kills people. Um, and it's just, it's sort of, it's like this guy, Joe is, who's just irresistible. He can like talk about Hemingway, talk about Dostoevsky. He's like woke and he's funny and all these things. Um, and then he's going to steal your phone and put you in a basement cage and kill you. Um, I mean, everybody has something. <laughs> everybody has something. Everybody's got their shit, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, anyway, the, the miracle of this whole thing is that you're laughing the whole time and you're sort of still rooting for Joe. Um, it's just full of like funny 90s pop culture references kind of hilarious takes on culture today and it's just like like i said catnip if you're like a literary person who wants a really fun read by somebody who's just totally on it uh these you books are just amazing so that was my next one jenna what about you love love and i love the you books and i love the you series i'm going to tell a little story a behind the scenes story about this because this is why you guys all sign on right so one day i had just finished the crown i was in mourning because i finished the crown by mistake and then i was like oh my god i need another <laughs> series i have like a serious hangover now what is going to be as good as <laughs> as the crown and so i was like trolling around on netflix and i watched a trailer for you and I was like, oh, this is so sharp. Like the writing is so sharp. It's so funny. Caroline actually writes the way people think, the way they talk. Like she has a very, very sharp ear. And so I was texting Mark as I do at like 2.30 in the morning. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just watching this thing called You. And he was like, how do you know about this? I'm like, I'm trolling on Netflix. Mark and Caroline had a connection that you would like to tell them all about, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, we went to college together. Awesome. And, um so yeah, so we knew each other kind of back in, you know, when we first moved to New York at the same time, Caroline and I knew each other. And um, so it was just, and I, we hadn't really been in touch over the years, just like only here and there. And then the next day you look and you're like, oh, this person has the most massive show on Netflix. And it was crazy. Yeah, it was very cool. And Caroline, I happen to know, is on Cape Cod. So my goal in life in 2022, well, I have some other goals as well, um, to read, do more Blazy things but i also would like to get me and mark and caroline together for drinks like drinks and discuss, discuss <laughs> and past and also all of our collective futures but she's amazing you should watch the show okay i will do i just saw this lady last night jody pico wish you were here so i went to see jody at the brookline booksmith with my friend tracy han burkett and kat mazor and sat in the audience like a regular person like not like a writer and watched jody talk to ellen hildebrand but my behind the scenes on jody is that she's super nice she helped me launch woodrow on the bench she came down from new hampshire even though she had asthma and like did the first live reading since march 2020 at the booksmith with me at um for woodrow and she should be a total diva because, okay, Daniel, yes, you're totally coming, but you can host it in a hot tub. Otherwise, we are not even, we're not even doing this with you. But like, if you like <laughs> volunteer your hot tub and the bottle, me, Caroline, and Mark will come get in the hot tub. We'll be brief. Okay. We're only 15 minutes in. Where are we going to be? Okay. okay. All right. What's the party going to be by like the end of the show? Oh, everybody on this chat is going to be in the hot tub by that time. Like everybody. Goals, life goals, life goals. So um, Jody should be a diva, as we all know. She's like an incredible New York Times bestseller. Everything she does goes to the top of the list with good reason, but she's actually not a diva. She's like this tiny little person with beautiful red curls who like is just incredibly kind, incredibly sharp, incredibly fast. Wish You Were Here, which I actually haven't read yet because I just got the hardcover last night and I read only in hardcover, is about a woman who goes to the Galapagos during the pandemic and gets stuck. So she wanted to answer the question. She was trying to put her arms around what it was like to be a writer and to write about the pandemic and how do we even think about this? And she said, I really wanted to figure out what it was like to be in paradise, like while the rest of the world shut down and how your life could get sidelined and how that kind of points us all in new directions or points that character in new directions. But that whole metaphor is about all of us like entering this wormhole that none of us asked to enter and coming out the other side with some new revelations and not all of them being bad. And so the book she said she wrote in two months and didn't write it according to outline. Usually she has 42 pages of outlines, researches, does the same thing that I do when I write a book, like outline first and research and writes, blah, blah, blah. but she said, I just wrote this in two months and I was just feeling my way into it um, because I was confused about how to deal with the pandemic. And so that 
wish you were here is Jody Pico's response to the pandemic. And also the Galapagos, which she chose sort of on accident, turned out to be, of course, an excellent metaphor for the pandemic because a species either adapts or it fades away. So what is it gonna be for us? So it was incredibly interesting to listen to her talk about this. I know she's in Cleveland tonight. She's on a tour, you can see her virtually, but I, I highly, highly recommend this book. I will read it alongside you and we can have a little book club. In the hot tub. <laughs> and now you're catching on my friend. Now you know how the game is played. She wrote that, but oh. she wrote that book in two months? Two months, yes, that happens sometimes. Yes, yes. And our friend Christina Powers suggests the audiobook as well, which is really good to know. Thank you, Christina, for those of us who do a lot of driving, like for instance, on book tour, and you can listen to the audiobook as well. Or walking the dog in the house, listen to audio in the hot tub, whatever. Okay. This is my next book. Oh, you did not just pull out the Jumpa Lahiri card. Oh, you did you didn't tell I me did. that you were reading I did. It was time. It you was didn't time. tell me you were Jumpa. All right. <laughs> um, Jumpa in the elevator story, by the way. What are all these elevator stories? How much time do you spend in elevators? A lot. Okay. Um, so <laughs> elevators and hot tubs only. Um, so <laughs> the, the Jenna Blum story. Um, so, <laughs> so this book, um, I love this book and I, and I loved it in this particular way in that I, um, it was so not the kind of book that I would read uh, normally or like normally. And actually, uh, Daniel Ford, uh, he invited me on one of his podcasts of his podcast, Empire at Writer's Bone. And um, I had a conversation um, about this book and what I thought of it. And I just loved it. I mean, look, it's one of these slim gems of a book. Um, the prose is off the charts. It's like 200 pages max. I mean, this is just a tiny, tiny book. I and mean, that's a hardcover. It would be much smaller if it was paperback. Um, but it's just like... So the thing that's so interesting, I'll just say one thing about this book. I, I have so much to say about this book, but I'll just say one thing in the interest of time, which is this, that it has no plot. It's episodic. It reminds me of Samuel Beckett in that like sort of nothing happens. It's about this kind of like lonely woman in an Italian, an unnamed Italian city who just kind of like her life is completely slack and she goes to the pool and she goes grocery shopping and she, you know, goes and buys some luggage and like that's sort of the whole book. Um, and so you're thinking, how could this possibly be interesting? And I th and I was like thinking like, why is this book actually even a page turner? Uh, it's not just that the writing is good, but um, I realized as I was reading the book, I was like, it's sort of like a David Attenborough nature documentary where it's about like some like endangered species in like the jungle, like some beautiful, small endangered like snail that has this really weird like mating cycle and eating strategy. And they live under this like piece of bark and but like it, they come out at night and they glow or something. And it's like and the whole thing is like, how will this endangered kind of small, lonely, spectacular creature survive? That was like why you got into it. Um, I don't know, it was just, um, it was so well done in such a strange book. Um, I just, for the li for the literary folks out there who love good prose and just exquisite is the word that's always used with this book. Um, and I just wholeheartedly agree, so. That's really interesting. I hadn't heard of this when I knew she was doing a sort of immersion thing in the Italian language and she had written a nonfiction book about her learning Italian um, and P.S. Jumpa went to um, BU a year ahead of me in my graduate program. And thank God she was not in my year because if I had Jumpa Lahiri in my workshop in my year and achieved this astronomical success, I'd be like, I am just going to go become a lonely woman who lives in Italy and buys suitcases. Like that's all I'm going to do with my life. But thank God I was a year behind her. So I was able to... <laughs> dominate like the pup fish that I am. Yeah. So um, and we should talk about pup fish for people who didn't watch that episode, who missed out on the pup fish episode, but I will ask you to explain. But it kind of sounds like the Knausgaard novels. Like, do you remember these from a year, a few years back where people like this guy had written these 900 page books about nothing and people were obsessed with them. And it was just supposed to be reflective of life. And I was of two minds about this. And one is I'm absolutely not reading those. And the other thing was, I'm really glad there's room for books that are still reflective of life because right now we are also harnessed to plot. We're so harnessed to like the instant gratification of like series, right? That it's really good to know there's still room in literary fiction for a sort of Mrs. Dalloway slash Pupfish slash Beckett kind of book that just shows how people live like a Richard Ford kind of thing, right? Like I, 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 I totally agree. Uh, except that 
the one thing that like just turned me off so much from those canal scarred books is how bloated they were. And this book is so slim and boiled down and like every sentence counts. Um, it's just so tight. Um, so the DNA of the book is in every sentence, right? Notice how I bought that back around. Don't you want me Call to be back. on your show every week? You totally want me to be on your show every week. <laughs> You it's do. not really my show anymore. It's your show now. <laughs> oh, did I hijack your show? I'm sorry, not sorry. Okay, my next. So my next book is Tatiana Dumane, whose name I finally learned to pronounce after I hosted her on Friday Frontliner and was pronouncing her name wrong. But then after that interview when we let her go, um, I was like, oh, is it Tatiana Dumane? Oops, it's not Devazne, like we say in New Jersey. Oh, my God, that was so apt. Um, and I think, Mark, you were producing the interview we did with her. Am I right about that? So yeah, that was wonderful. So behind the scenes on this is that Tatiana, of course, was five hours ahead of us, and she was joining us from Paris. And she, um, it was 9 o'clock her time when we did the interview. And after we did the interview, we hung out in the green room with her. And she was like, look, look, children, I'm going to turn my screen around, and you'll see the Eiffel Tower light up. And we were like, ooh, ah, like it was just fantastic. She was so generous. So you should buy her book for that. But also, I loved this book because it was very, it's its like a cli-fi, sci-fi book about a woman who lives in Paris by herself. She is of a certain age and lives in an apartment in the sort of indeterminate future, like maybe 10 or 15 years in the future. And the apartment is controlled by artificial intelligence. So sort of like those of you who have like smart homes now, like I have apps on my phone where I can turn on my air conditioner or turn my lights on and off, like just from an app, but the home kind of runs itself. And as the woman is in the apartment by herself, Paris experiences this incredible heat wave that's really dangerous for everybody. So they have to stay inside. And then she's trapped in the apartment with the artificial intelligence and weird things start to happen. So it's this sort of Hitchcockian, Daphne du Maurier, I know Tatiana loves Daphne du Maurier, like this whole sort of psychological thriller in this incredibly elegant prose. So if you're looking for something that's really consuming, if you're looking for something that addresses a sort of climate change angle, um, and just looking for something that's transporting. Like if you want to go to Paris for a while, like this is the book for you. Love it. Yeah. What she was so awesome to talk she to. What awesome. a, I, I, I met her just in the green room, but I felt like I sort of, after I was done talking to her for 10 minutes, I felt like she was my friend for life, you know? Mm -hmm. She's awesome. This is her, yeah. This is my blurb. Cli-fi with elegant prose in Paris. Thank you, Margaret. You are a master, <laughs> you are a master of collating all of the long right. things I'll say into. Okay, fine. I'm done. Now. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Fine. Quiet now. <laughs> Quiet. My I didn't mean to cut you off. I didn't mean to no, cut you off. No, it's good. I'm Next quiet book. now. I'm quiet now. Black Buck by Matteo Escarapur. Now, I love this book. It was pitched to me as Wolf of Wall Street meets Sorry to Bother You, two of my favorite movies. Still just going to throw in that I think Sorry to Bother You should have won Best Picture that year. I'm never going to get off that horse. It's a random thing to say, but people who out, out there who know what I'm talking about, yes, you already know, should have won Best Picture. Moving on. Um, Mateo Escarapur, dude, this interview was fire. It was so great. I really related to him. I used to be in business myself. I used to run a sales team in New York City. Um, I find, this is just a pet peeve of mine, that I find that a lot of writers um, don't understand business uh especially like in the literary sphere i mean maybe like you know books about you know kind of I don't, I don't read a lot of like thrillers or legal thrillers or things like that but i'm sure some of those books are maybe smarter on corporations and things like this but you very rarely hear from somebody who actually like was legitimately in business and actually likes business i mean i think there's often a default stance in literary fiction against business or against entrepreneurship and that is just not what you see here i mean this is a, this book is a satire and he does make fun of sales culture in a way but he has such a command of like what a sales team is like i mean this book reminded me of glenn gary glenn ross and boiler room great kind of like intense cool sales stories but the book is also very funny and it's about you know how do you make it in the corporate world as a person of color um i just 
I thought the book was so, so fresh. It ended up being a, a Jenna Bush uh, pick on Good Morning America. or um, And the book did really, really well. And I just, I would just recommend anybody, if you're going to watch any Thoughtful Bro interview, I mean, they're all like, I love them all. But this one was just so high energy. And it was like two guys who are like sales team leaders, former sales team leaders, like going at each other, like, Rah! Um, so, um, it was so fun. I love Mateo. I wish him the best. He just sold his second book. Um, what he did, what is it? Yeah, it's, oh, it, I, for, I forget what it was called. I just saw it on publisher's marketplace this summer, but, um, he did sell his second book. And, oh, one other thing I wanted to say just real quick is that Mateo is like a guerrilla marketer. So this is like, mm. he made up this, he had this thing made, this is a baseball hat. Like it's a little bit small cause I have a giant noggin. Um, but this hat is the black buck hat. I mean, he like sells swag for his, uh, stuff on his site and for his books. And it's like you, Jen, I mean, you are like an animal gorilla marketer for your stuff. You, you go to the ends of the earth to try to find interesting ways to get people interested in your books. And I just so much respect to Mateo for doing this kind of stuff. So. Good. That is awesome. Yeah. And that interview, guys, I was producing that interview and I was like, oh, the energy in this interview is so positive and so amazing. And Mateo's like anecdotes about his time in that world, which I know nothing about because I used to be like a lowly waitress. I know y'all's is like Wolf of Wall Street guys, but would have. Um, it was really contagious energy. So if you're looking for like you've ever a day when you're just like, oh, it's getting dark at four o'clock and I'm kind of yeah. feeling low and, you know, I've already had eight cups of coffee. They're not doing anything. I highly suggest going to our Facebook, uh, our YouTube page and digging up the interview with Mark and Mateo because it was incredibly feel good to the point at which I was trying to recruit him for a long time to be a voice <laughs> on your host because I was like, this dude has totally gotten it. And he was like, no, I want to write another book. And I'm like, how selfish. Like, really? <laughs> how selfish priorities next okay so this is what i'm reading right now and i'm so glad to be able to tell you like i actually know what i'm reading right now because usually people are like what are you reading and my brain shorts out and i could write on my hand what i'm reading and i would still not remember but i just got this book from chloe what is a dog i'm going to be talking to chloe at 7 p.m this friday we're going to have a yappy hour a cocktail hour talk about our dog momorist memoirs and I remember this book came out this summer and Mark texted me and he was like, yo, JB, yo, on your horizon, there's this book and it has a quote from John Irving. And the quote is, the book is for anyone who's ever loved a dog. And my tagline for Woodrow on the Bench is for anyone who's ever loved an old dog. And I was like, do I have to take her out? Like, do I have to like sniper her, just like have a small accident, you know, with a dog team from Alaska or something? I don't know. And then I'm like, no. There's room for all of us dog loving people out there. So <laughs> Chloe is safe now. I'm reading the book and I actually have a book. And our books are a little different because my book is about the last seven months that I had with my beloved Black Lab Woodrow and what it taught me. So I'm really telling tales on myself as well as memorializing my dog. Chloe's book is about all of the dogs from all the chapters of her life and what they meant for each chapter so like the different dogs that she had and their different personalities and so really like if you have been a dog owner your whole life and you know each dog is different um this is a book for you to give obvi with my book as a book bundle i feel like how i did a commercial for myself there but i mean i do think like if you are looking to like really please dog lovers and thank you thank look at you. look at how nice they look together they do, right? They look so good. Thank you. Um, and so Chloe and I are going to be having drinks and talking dogs 7 p.m. Eastern this Friday. Come and join us and come tell us about the dogs in your life. Having you. drinks and talking dogs. Having <laughs> drinks and talking dogs. <laughs> it just sounds like a country song. <laughs> I mean, don't even get, did you not go there? You just went there. You want me to sing about having drinks and talking dogs. Or it sounds, you know what, you know, it sounds, it sounds like a euphemism for something, right? Like, oh, what, what were we doing? Oh, we were just having drinks and talking dogs, you know. <laughs> oh, y'all know. Y'all know what I mean. All right. Yeah. You know, you just did not go there. Now I'm going to have to compose a song before 7 p.m. on Friday. Thank you. Guys, just a few books left. Um, so another book that I really, really loved, and this is like a real honor for me to do this interview, is with Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. Mm. Um, yeah, he wrote this book, Here Right Matters, 
which is a quote from his Senate testimony uh, during the first Trump impeachment trials um, when his father asked him um, or a senator asked him, are you afraid? Um, are you afraid of the repercussions of doing the right thing and reporting um, corruption to the proper channels? And he said, no, because this isn't Russia where I grew up. This is America. And in America, right matters. Um, one of the great quotes kind of from our recent civic memory. Um, and I just, the book was so great. There's uh, My interview with him kind of got into everything. And so I don't want to rehash the whole interview now or the whole book. But you know, just for those who didn't know, he was on this call with President Zelensky. He was listening in. He was one of the top Ukraine experts in the country at the time. And, you know, this is the famous call when Trump said to Zelensky, um, you know, I need you to do me a favor. In other words, I'm not going to release $400 million in military aid to the Ukraine unless you, President Zelensky, announce an investigation into Joe Biden, a fraudulent investigation into Joe Biden. Um, and, you know, so this book is about the decisions that uh, so, um, Vinman made uh, in the aftermath of that. And um, it was just, it's just a real profile and courage. And, you know, why are people courageous? Um, what does it take to summon the courage? And he said some really interesting things about the nature of courage. Like one is that he said he didn't view himself as courageous. He just viewed himself as somebody who is doing what he was told to do. I mean, this is, I mean, many, many senior officials in the U.S. military have said he did exactly what we tell people to do. Um, so he was just following kind of his own code. Um, he wasn't like standing up to the president of the United States per se. He also, um, he had a lot of examples of courage from his own family and soldiers in his own family who had risked a great deal. Um, he said that to not do anything this is the last thing I'll say about it, but he said that to not do anything in the face of corruption has a inevitable consequence. So it's not when you're, when you're choosing between, should I do something courageous or not? Just recognize that doing nothing is also a choice and uh, also has a consequence and it, and you will pay a price for doing nothing. And so that was, we just got into a lot of like, how do you do something that was so historic and so courageous? Um, and it was just a fascinating thing from somebody who I think is a, uh, a real American hero. And what he said in that interview, he said, I'm not afraid and I won't be silent. And um, I think it's it's just something for all of us Americans to really think about. That was an incredibly inspiring interview. And we were so proud and honored and humbled at The Blaze to be able to interview Lieutenant Colonel Vinman. I have to say that when Mark told me, because all of our on-air hosts book their own guests with you know of authors with books coming out, I was on a beach when Mark texted me and said, I'm going to be interviewing Vinman. And I let out this scream on the beach that terrified like all the mothers and their children's, but I was so, their children's, their chillins. I'm writing that song now, y'all. It terrified the chillins. But I was so, <laughs> I was so excited that we would get to talk to somebody who I consider an American hero. And I have to say, guys, like, again, if you want a shot in the arm on a day in January or February, you're feeling kind of low, you know, we get the Vinman book. Watch the interview with Mark and Vinman because Vinman was really smiley. And I didn't like he had this lovely, gentle air about him. He was very funny at the same time he stood on his convictions. And that was not a side of him that any of us got to see during the hearings. We just saw somebody who was upstanding in the face of like immense pressure. But to see that he was also just this truly lovely, funny, gentle, sweet soul was such a revelation. So I highly, highly recommend watching. And so op optimistic about America. So optimistic. He was. So also, yes, this is a good lesson to carry forward into 2022 as we continue to be polarized into two nations. He did feel optimistic about it. And since he was in the middle of that clockwork, it's well worth your time watching the interview to find out why he was optimistic. It was really great. And Mark, thank you for doing that interview. Like that was like the highlight of my year. I think that in the Saunders interview that I missed, sadly. Um, Thank you, Jenna. That's you're welcome. Great. I will continue to hang out in elevators and try to <laughs> maybe see Vinman as well as George Saunders. So do I have time for one more book? Go, go quick. We'll each do one more. Okay. And guys, if you have, we're going to do like a little lightning round. Um, if you have readers who you're having trouble buying for, ask, and we will tell you what to buy. Um, okay. So here's my last book, These Precious Days by Ann Patchett, which is now out. I have it in galley, obviously. So Ann Patchett, and I have an amazing elevator story with Ann Patchett, where it's just like, I really, Mark knows this story. It's actually not an elevator story, but it's 
almost as bad as an, as an embarrassing elevator story about Ann Patchett when I totally embarrassed myself with her, which I'll tell you if we have time and not if we don't. But Anne is one of my favorite authors like me. She's an author at HarperCollins. I have loved her books ever since pre-Bel Canto. So I was on the Anne train before she had that big Oprah hit. I loved Patron Saint of Liars. So I would love to know in the chat, like, what are your favorite Anne Patchett books? But I've read everything of hers ever since then. And I have to say, like, I love Bel Canto. I love Patron Saint. My favorite Anne Patchett books are her essays. And she wrote this incredible essay collection called This is a Story of a Happy Marriage. Um, and I just relished those essays. And now this book, These Precious Days, is another one of her essay collections. And I don't know about you guys, but I often have trouble reading right now. Um, my attention has gotten fragmented, not just from the beginning of the pandemic, but because we read a lot for Blaze. Like we have to read several books a week for Blaze. And sometimes even if I love the books, I feel like a foie gras goose being stuffed with books. You know, like you have to read them quickly. You don't get to savor them. And so it takes a lot for a book to just draw me in the way a book used to draw me in, just for the sheer old fashioned pleasure of reading. These Precious Days is like that. Every one of these essays is just an immersive gem. So for you and Patchett fans, she is out with a new book. And if you want to see Anne live in action, I want to say April 2020, like when the world was just shutting down, Anne and Parnassus Books was on our series Authors Love Bookstores. And that is in our YouTube archive in our library. So if you want to see Ann Patchett in her own bookstore with her dogs, you can go to YouTube and look up um, the, the Ann Patchett interview with Kimberly Hensel Lawrence and Joe Moldover, which was amazing. Great. That Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, that that interview that they did with Ann Patchett in her bookshop was great, and I love that. I love mm -hmm. Authors Love Bookstores, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. Just another one of our shows that is always highlighting indie bookstores all around the country. And I think this week on Authors Love Bookstore, they're going across the pond. Uh, they're interviewing a, a, a local bookstore in England. So yes, they're right. doing UK edition. So bring your tea and pinkies up for that and your bickies. And we'll all go across the pond. And watch the interview. What? What is your problem? <laughs> you have a problem. Back out of the room, the queen is speaking. Uh, um, wonderful. Thank you, Jenna. You're welcome. That, 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 made, that made the interview for me. Um, my last book is this book. Oh, very good. So Mitch Album is one of the, is sold more books than almost any American alive today. It's probably sold about 45 or 50 million books. His book, Tuesdays with Maury, of course, is the best-selling memoir of all time. Um, and this book is a work of fiction. He's written a few works of fiction. Um, it's about, you know, for some folks who are the big, kind of big wigs, presidents, CEOs, rich people who are on a boat um, out in the Atlantic Ocean. And then um, there's a shipwreck and then um, some survivors float on this life raft. And then God crawls out of the water and onto the boat. God, I put God in quotes because you have to read the book to figure out like, is it God or is it not? But this is a very enigmatic figure who comes out of the water and sort of answers prayers, but doesn't answer them, offers some wisdom, but doesn't offer wisdom. It's a very enigmatic, mysterious kind of um, divine figure that is on this boat. But what I want to say about this is like, Mitch Album for me, it just kind of occupies a kind of interesting space for me because he, um, Jenna and I, as writers, one thing we talk about a lot, or one thing I talk to Jenna about, because it's so important to me, is the issue of intentionality. Um, when you write, and kind of like, I have this thing that comes up every day in my calendar. It says, um, who is this for, and why do they need it? That is like a daily reminder to myself about writing. Who is this for, and why do they need it? Because I believe that you really should be thinking about that when you're telling a story. Um, who are you telling the story to and, and, and why do they need to hear that story? And, you know, in the, in the interview with Mitch a few weeks ago, I asked him about that and he just said, you know, look, I'm not into horror. I'm not into like stories about, you know, you know, families falling apart and things like that. And there's a place for that. And other people write those books. But for me, he's just, I, there's a lot of pain in this world. And I would hope that when people are in pain, they'd want to reach for one of my books and get some comfort, you know? And you may disagree or disagree with that sentiment about like, that's what a book ought to be for. But what I admire so much about is his own kind of clarity of purpose when he's writing. Um, and he just knows what kind of impact he wants his books to have on the world. And indeed, this book is a comforting book. Um, so 
I really love Mitch and his work for that reason. And that interview was terrific. And Mitch, boy, he was on like, C he was on Thoughtful Bro in between like Good Morning America and CNN. And so I just, it was great that he came on the show and that was such a treat. Mm, that was so good. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to finish right when you're in the middle of <laughs> Dude, that. I'm eating a candy cane. Can you please get the priorities <laughs> right right now? Like seriously, I was right in the middle of like getting to the curve of the candy cane. It's a very important part. But I have to say, <laughs> I'm really moved by the fact that you ask yourself. I, I honestly didn't know this about you. And Mark and I talk about writing a lot, y'all. Like, it is not just fun and games on the Bro and Ho show. Like, we do Bro and Ho show every day. We do Debrief. We talk about Thoughtful Bro. We talk about Blaze. We talk about all the things. But we also talk about writing a lot and the sort of purity of intent of writing and how to translate that into plot and structure and character in a way that will then carry messages to readers. Writers write for a spectrum of reasons. They write in a spectrum of ways both in process and in intent. But one of the things that Mark really tries to get across when he's working on his own stuff is an emotional reaction that somehow helps people in some way and conveys the lesson of the book he's trying to write. So the Mitch album essay was like right up his alley and that was amazing. But I think like asking yourself every day, like who am I writing this for and who, why do they need it? What an amazing question for a writer to ask every day. And actually, I think that is a writer question that would get me out of bed because I am a very lazy writer. Like I like to write a book and then go on tour for like five years. Like I write books in order to be able to connect with people, which is why Blaze is so much fun for me. Like I get to connect with you guys every day. It is like such a joy and a privilege. And now I'm also connecting with people in three dimensions on tour. So this is luscious and delicious, but you know, there is actually a writing component to my life as a writer. And I don't always want to get up out of bed and write. Cause I think like, what is the, you know, what is the point of this? Or I'm like noodling on a story. It doesn't really seem to be working. Thinking of writing as an act of service, I think would definitely get a fire under my butt to write. So thank you for sharing that. And it reminds me of the Priyanka Champaneri interview we did as well. Like if you could talk about that just for one second, I, I totally like had that flash into my head. Yeah, I mean, that Priyanka Champaneri, she wrote another amazing book that's won a bunch of awards, and um, it's called The City of Good Death. And um, she was on the show, and she just talked about this idea of artistic karma. Mm -hmm. And this is an idea that you hear in one form or another, kind of in different places. Another place, another person who's big on a similar version of this idea is um, uh, the woman who wrote Big Magic. Why am I? Um, Elizabeth Gilbert. Gilbert. Yep. Elizabeth Gilbert, Big Magic, this um, this idea that like, you know, you as a writer can only do so much and, you know, you put your butt in the chair as the saying goes every day and you just sit there and do it. And the rest is sort of like in the hands of the universe or the muse or karma or what have you. But you generate good artistic karma by showing up every day and um, trying to kind of write with a good intention and write in good faith. And then the muse will be there sometimes and the muse will not be there sometimes, but that's just sort of not your business, you know? Right. Right. You have to do this. But I think like thinking about it as like the muse is there so that I can help people. Yeah. Because I just, you know, I write to help people feel less alone, whether I'm writing fiction, or whether I'm writing memoir, I write to help people feel like they're not alone in their experience. And to just say like, I have felt this, or I felt this through the prism of one of my characters. And so well, you, you know, Jenna, it's so funny you say that because there is just one more book I wanted to talk about for the show. And Woodrow on the Bench, folks, um, the la my last must-buy book of the year, another Slim Gem. Mark, <laughs> Mark's Slim Gems. Not Mark's Beef Jerky uh, line of Slim Gems, but That's Mark's Slim Gems. Mark's line of literature called Slim Gems. Um there was one of the one of my favorite moments of the whole year was in that interview with you about Woodrow on the Bench. It's a great book, folks. It's about grief. And I was, one of the things that I said to Jenna from the beginning about this book when I read it long before it got published was I wouldn't normally read a book about grief, but this book, um, because it was about a dog, I was like, I'll read this. And then it's like sneakily just got into me and deep into my bones. And it was a way to kind of help think about um, all kinds of grief, obviously human grief um, too. And uh, just a book of just such great accessibility and humanity. It's so easy to read. It's so, so emotional. But um, in that interview, one thing I said is that, you know, what I love about the way you approach writing is how you view it as community building. And one of the things that you said when I asked you about that, I just want to read this quote because I love it so much. Um, if you've ever sat alone in your apartment, 
or felt alone or lost someone or just felt like a freak, <laughs> you're not a freak. I'm here. We're all here. We can all be freaks together. And I just love that so much. And I just feel like, in a way, that's what the blaze is. You know, it's a community. We can all be freaks together a couple times a week. And um, I just love that sentiment, Jenna. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. I don't even have anything sarcastic to say. <laughs> you broke me. <laughs> I'm broken now, but in a good way. Um, and the broken places are where the light gets in, right? So thank you for that. I think, you know, I have no better way to conclude this than that if we are concluding it, but just saying like, thank you for all, to all of you out there who are joining us every week or joining us for the first time, are posting your comments, are sharing your book love um, and are keeping our community alive and the blaze burning bright. We're going into our third year. I wrote that last night in a, in a sort of inner company email and I thought, oh my God, we're going into our third year as the blaze. It is because of you people out there. It is because of you, Mark. It's because of you, Margaret, behind the scenes. It's because of Blazers, but it's because of Blaze Nation that you guys show up every week to watch our shows. And we're so grateful. We're going to keep bringing you the writers, keep bringing you the new books. And I know like, even though we're sort of venturing out in the world, we're still all watching our screens and there's no need to feel alone ever because we can all be freaks together. And I just, I love that. Like, thank you. Mm. A beautiful Christmas sentiment. A beautiful Christmas sentiment. Well, Jenna, thank you so much for being on the show. You did not disappoint. Um, okay, I had to. I had to. Even though I'm a little um, subdued now because you said nice things about my book, I'm still like, oh, yeah. Um, folks, on The Thoughtful Bro, that's it for this week. And that's also it for uh, this year on Thoughtful Bro. Um, I'm going to take a, some much needed rest, but I will be back. I've got a bunch of awesome, cool new stuff scheduled um for january um there's a great new book by a friend of mine from college another friend of mine from college oh my gosh um she probably knows caroline um it's called olga dies dreaming by zochil gonzalez mm -hmm. it's already in production this is her first book it's already in production for hulu um again that book is called olga dies dreaming that's my next show i think it's on january 11th so um thank you so much to everybody who's supported the thoughtful bro and watched i'm just so so grateful to me it's just an absolute labor of love i would pay to do this show. I would myself pay you to let me do this show. I love it so much. So thank you for watching. Thank you, Jenna. We'll see everybody next year. I heard you say that. <laughs> Bring me the money. Bring me the money. Thank you, Blaze Nation. We love you. Bye.